Hello everyone, welcome to Accessibility with React. Uh, my name is Russell Skaggs and I'll be talking to you today. Um, thank you guys for sticking around all of the sessions of this virtual JavaScript and friends. So I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Russell Skaggs. I've spent about a decade in front end development. Uh, and I mostly focus on CSS and design systems. But as part of my focus on design systems, I found myself really interested in learning about React. Um, I found that React was a really good, interesting tool to help solve the design system needs. But despite my growing love for React, a lot of people in my community didn't share my enthusiasm. And it could be very well that I was late to the game because by the time I got there, I learned that React had a bit of a reputation problem, specifically when it comes to accessibility. Now, a lot of times reputation problems stem from real problems. Some of the reputation is founded when WebAIM took a look at a million of the most popular websites on the internet and broke it down by uh, JavaScript frameworks, it found that the websites that used React on average did have higher rates of accessibility errors. But the real question, is this an issue with React? Mark Stedman of DeQ, a globally recognized uh, company that are world-class experts in accessibility, stated, the stigma that React is not an accessible framework is simply not true. It has some of the best built-in accessibility functionality there is out there and a large community of accessibility advocates that are creating content that is easily consumable in your application. So how did we get to this place where React has this reputation of being not accessibility friendly? Well, I can't think about this problem without thinking about the article, The Great Divide, that Chris Coyer wrote on CSS Tricks uh, a year or so back. In that article, he talked about the growing divide between the different types of front-end developers. On one hand, you have people who are excellent expert JavaScript engineers. They are super interested in data structures, JavaScript architecture, and performance. On the other hand, you had people who were more like UX engineers. They found more that they were able to bring value in helping to create semantic markup focusing on visual and interaction design, even going so far as to learn the tools that their other visual and interaction design partners would use. And they also be, tended to be more concerned with accessibility and design systems. Kind of at like a high level, it felt to me that the JavaScript engineers sort of favored the computer side of the front end development, whereas the UX engineers more favored the human side of front-end development, and I will recognize that that is an oversimplification. So when we look at it from this lens, where a lot of the folks that are more interested in accessibility also tend to be less interested in the more hard technical side of front-end, I think we have to recognize also that React was and kind of still is technically complicated. When I first got into React, it was probably a couple months before the Context API came out, at least the current one. And in order to do any sort of state management, that meant using classes. Like I said before, I'm a CSS guy, and this whole concept of using like these new JavaScript classes was a bit foreign to me. I learned it to solve a problem, but I didn't really care for it. And I was constantly finding myself confused. 
And issues like prop drilling and communicating state to the right places was very, very challenging. Thankfully, because of when I came in, I got to see the rapid evolution. I got to see it move from just having the state-based architecture with prop drilling to being able to use the context consumers and providers. Then I got to experience being able to leverage, you know, state inside of functional components using hooks to the point now where I kind of disregard all of that old class stuff, even though it tends to be the way the documentation is written still. But even to get to that point, I had to do a major catch up on my own JavaScript knowledge. Being more of a CSS guy, I tended to use basic whatever worked JavaScript at the time. So the cutting edge didn't cut it for me. I wasn't really interested in pre-compiling and doing a lot of the Babel translations that were necessary until I started looking to React. And so what I really found was a lot of my struggles with React in particular weren't necessarily with React, but it was catching up on all of those new features that ES6 had brought us. So technical complexity aside, some of the common React accessibility complaints are things like non-semantic or broken markup, page titles not being updated, and improper keyboard focus. Now, I do want to talk about the non-semantic and broken markup, because this is one of those issues that used to be 100% React's fault. For a long time, React had to have some element wrapping all of your logic. So if you were creating high order components, you had to wrap those high order components in a div. This could sometimes lead to you creating components where you would have a div between a set of list items and an unordered list. Now you could argue that the developers should have accounted for that and worked around it, what have you, but the reality is not having the fragments at the beginning was a major miss. Thankfully, that's not so much an issue. So looking at these problems that have been identified, I, I think I found three good solutions. First, we just write valid markup. Next, we update the page title when you switch pages on a single page app. And then finally, we make the components accessible to keyboards. And there you have it. That is how you write React in an accessible way. But of course, it is a bit more complicated than that. When thinking about really how to write something in an accessible way, I want to go back to the question of who is responsible for ensuring accessibility. And the answer is everyone. And when I say everyone, I don't mean just the front-end developers that are UX engineers and the front-end developers who are JavaScript engineers. I mean everyone. Anyone who touches the project, the site, the application, is responsible for its accessibility. It cannot be an afterthought. It must be baked into the designs, and it must be something that the business cares about. But understanding that there's only so much we as developers can do, let's break apart our accessibility concerns. So I'm gonna probably make a big assumption here. I'm gonna assume that you're using some sort of component-based architecture. Why? Because if you aren't using a component-based architecture and you're using React, I don't really know why you would do such a thing. Um, components are the greatest part of using a system like React, so you can just inject uh, UI over and over and over again and keep your code dry. So let's think about like what are the concerns of the component? Well, the component knows what parts of the, what, what pieces of the individual component are related to one another. 
you know that when you're when you're writing out the markup the css the javascript <clears throat> but it may not know always the right html tags to use because that's really more of an integration concern at the time of integration that's where you'll have more of the context to where a component fa uh, falls onto the page you'll understand the difference between what you want to happen visually versus how the document tree needs to be rendered for screen readers. So as an example of that, let's take a look at headings. So in this component, we have a basic heading. Uh, we have decided to consolidate our headings, which we have three styles, into a single component. And we've decided that we will just go ahead and pass that we will just go ahead and pass the level of the component as a property. And then using that level, we will determine the right heading tag. And as we look at this page over here, it's great. H1, H2, H3. A very proper, well-structured document tree. But, for some reason on the next page down, our visual designer indicated that they wanted to use the heading two style as kind of the lead in for this page. When we inspect this, we can see that this element is in H2 as expected. So how do we get around this? Well, as a component author, we need to think about what sorts of things we will need on integration side. So for something like headings, I have never worked on a team where I have not had a designer ask for a heading two to be used in a place where it needs to be an H1. Designers tend to have slightly different preferences depending on the page layout. So, we need to account for that. And one way could just be adding an element parameter. So now we're adding this new property. And instead of having this be this Elm determined just by this H1, we can check if the Elm property is passed, and if not, then we will default back to our H uh, level. But this brings up a good point. When we look at this component, the only thing that's being used is the level, the element, the class name, and the children. This isn't a really flexible component. There may be other attributes that we may later need that I, as a component author, cannot be aware of. So, rather than just focusing on, on what I know, I need to embrace a little bit about what I don't know. So, I'm going to leverage React's, or sorry, I'm going to leverage uh, the ES6 operator uh, for REST arguments uh, in object destructuring. So I'm going to get the rest of the properties that may or may not be pass passed from this heading. Then I'm going to take them and I'm going to spread them across this heading element. And even when I look at this code now, I can see, well, if I'm already doing that, children is really just a prop, so I can simplify the code even further. So now, the heading cares about the level, the elm, the class name, and the props. So let's go into that detail screen where we were viewing it. So we have the headings over here. 
So we want this heading to be an H1. Similarly, we would want this one to be an H2. In this case, we're actually just talking about styles of the headings, and they're not meant to be headings for the content. So in this situation, we're going to make them divs. All right. All right, so we'll save that, and we'll make sure that these all get saved. Now, when we inspect this element, we can see that the markup is properly applied. And we can verify that by seeing the H1 here, the H2 here, and then the three divs. All right, so that's a way that we can help solve the document tree issue that would pop up when using something like a heading component onto a web page. Similar, similar to headings, buttons are kind of one of those UI elements that designers will use in different purposes. Sometimes it will legitimately be a button, but often it'll also be a link that goes off to another page. So let's open up the button. So we kind of have some of the similar problems here, um, but we did go ahead and spread the properties across. We don't have anything that currently would tell it um, or allow it to be a different element than a button. One option we could do would be to split up a button and a leak button into two separate components and export them differently. But that also feels a little bit uh, unnecessary. So when I'm thinking about using a button or a link, more often than not, the only thing I need to know about to determine if there is a differentiator is whether or not there's an href. So, for this, let's add an Elm constant similar to how we did on the headings. Only here, we're gonna check if the href is passed. And if it is, we're gonna make, we're gonna make that Elm an anchor tag. And if there isn't, we will fall back to a button. Then we can just take that and put it here. And now, if we refresh this page, we can see that that link will open in a new tab. Let's take a look at our tabs. So when we open up the code, things look, things look pretty good. Um, going through here, uh, we have leveraged a few React hooks because this is a little bit more of a complicated UI piece. Um, we're leveraging the reducer so that we can add tabs as they get applied um, in a situation like this um, so that we can add them just using a tabs panel. And when I run an Axe report on this page, we don't find any issues.
So let's quickly kind of go through uh, this tab component. Um, and just so you can see what I'm doing, I will open up the keyboard viewer. So as we tab, we can see focus changing to the different <clears throat> elements. If we hit enter, uh, it switches accordingly. Yeah, so everything seems to be work to be working. Everything's accessible. We can clearly navigate it with keyboard. But this actually isn't right. It isn't right at all. And the reason that I wanted to show you this is that there's nothing that this automated tool, this great tool uh, such as X, could do to flag this particular error. Um, even within this tool, um, automated testing coverage can find up to 50% of issues. So it's hard to, when you have something like a complicated piece of UI that has to use certain things to tell assistive technologies how to interpret it, you also sort of have to tell the accessibility tests how to interpret it. So I pointed this out because this, in my earlier years, I would have assumed that this was fine because I could tab through the tabs, I could click on it, and it worked. But none of this is accessible to, to screen readers. And it doesn't really meet uh, some of the patterns that were recommended using the uh, WAI ARIA authoring practices. So there's a reason that I've pulled up this page uh, in this video rather than you know, copying some of the practices onto a slide to talk about. And that's because I want you to become very familiar with this page. If you aren't able to kind of reference these sorts of uh, best practices that are put out by the W3C, it really doesn't matter whether or not you are writing in React, whether or not you are writing in vanilla JavaScript, you won't make an accessible application. So, kind of clicking through here, uh, this big readme first is a good clue. Um, and as we're creating some of these like highly accessible things like tabs, um, we really need to adhere to some of these principles. Um, one of the things that stuck out is no aria is better than bad aria. So, it, it, it really is better to provide the screen reader no information than it is to misrepresent things. Um, and then it kind of abides by two principles, which you can read on the screen, but I'll say out loud. A role is a promise, and Aria can both cloak and enhance, creating both power and danger. So when you really want to dive into making sorts of rich applications accessible, you have to understand that you're taking on quite a bit of burden there. And you also need to make sure that you communicate with your team the amount of overhead that you will be taking on to build out these features. Like I said before, accessibility is everyone's problem, and we need to make sure that it is accounted for at every stage of the project. If you don't have time to build the feature in an accessible way, if you don't have time to test the features, you really don't have time to fit it into the project. So talking about tabs in particular, um, ARIA provides a nice list of design patterns and widgets. More often than not, anything that a designer would bring to you, you'll probably be able to map to something like this. So let's take a look to at the tabs. <clears throat> so tabs are a set of layered sections of content known as tab panels that display one at a time. Within the tabs, there is a tab list. Um, there would be several tabs that act as buttons and the tab panel that shows the content. And then, and here's where I think that it becomes really powerful and useful for us developers, 
It will even give you information about expected keyboard behavior. So for instance, um, when you tab, the focus moves into the tab list and, and puts it onto the active tab element. So before when I was looking at the tabs and I was tabbing through the tab list thinking I was following best practices, I wasn't because I was tabbing through all of the tabs rather than just the first one. Because the way you're supposed to interact with tabs isn't using the tab key, but rather using the arrow keys on the keyboard. <clears throat> so when focus is on one of the tabs, the spec dictates that the left arrow should move to the previous tab and loop back around to the last one if you're already at the first. And then the right arrow should focus to the next, looping back around to the first if you're already at the last. And then also, when focus is on a tab, um, enter or space would activate the tab if it's not activated automatically based on focus. Home and end are optional uh, key bindings that will get you to the first and last tab respectively. In our case, we don't have an associated pop-up menu, and we don't really have the ability to delete tabs, so we don't really need to, to worry about that. But as I was putting together this presentation, uh, this note stuck out to me. It is recommended to have the tabs activate automatically when they receive focus, as long as their associated tab panels are displayed without noticeable delay, or noticeable latency. So, that's the way that we're going to go about uh, coding it. All right, so this one's gonna be a little bit longer. Let's go into the tabs. So one of the things that um, we can kind of notice right off the bat by looking at the DOM elements There are no roles or references associated to the tabs. So let's go back and start by adding roles. So in this case, role equals tab. And when we go down to where this tabs component is living, where we're looping through all of our tab buttons, we have this div, and this is where we will want to assign a role of tab list. And then coming down here to the tab panel, a role of tab panel. So now when we look at the code, we can see the roles uh, lining up correctly. But just because we, they line up correctly, they're still not quite right. So let's open up one of their examples. For instance, the ones with automatic activation. This example acts as a good uh, test of what you would expect uh, yours to be in the end. 
And it also has, in its example, a good breakdown of the different roles, attributes, and elements being used in this example. So for the tab list, it's using an ARIA label. On each tab, it has a, an ARIA selected um, that is determined based on whether or not that tab is the active tab. And then it marks inactive tabs with a tag index of negative one to pull them out of the tab flow. And then probably more importantly for screen readers is that it adds this ARIA controls um, attribute so that it can tell the screen readers which tab or which tab panel that tab actually activates. And then down in the tab panel, we have the ARIA labeled by, which references back up to the tab. And then we set a tab index to zero so that the uh, keyboard user can uh, tab into the content. So let's do that. So uh, very simply here, we can add a tab index of zero. The tab panel um, for the button is at we can check is it active and if it is we want the tab index of zero otherwise we want a tab index of negative one um, we can see that we are using this id that we've generated um, for uh, for managing our tab uh, data inside of our reducer. So let's just go ahead and latch on to that ID as well, since it should be unique. And let's just say uh, ID equals ID uh, tab aria controls equals id panel and then aria selected is just is active And then going back down to the tab panel itself, we will add in an ID of uh, tab ID panel and aria labeled by tab ID tab. So the reason we're using a tab ID here is that we do want to provide the ability and the integration for someone to be able to self-select the ID by default. But also, if they don't give us an ID, we need it internally. So we default to using a GUI generate, uh, generator uh, nano ID. All right. So now, if we go over here, uh, let's refresh the page for good measure. And let's run Axe Accessibility Check again. All right. So now, um, we can see if I were to tab through 
it tabs to the active tab, and then it tabs to the content, then to the learn more, then to the go back. So our tabbing is working correctly. We can see in the markup that the tab circle CI um, is marked as selected, and that it also controls this panel down here. So with this, with these two, um, with these attributes, we've now given screen readers the context that they need to be able to properly uh, tell their users the relationship between this content in a way that wasn't really clear with the DOM uh, hierarchy alone. But we've still got some work to do. Um, if I were to click uh, the arrow buttons, nothing is happening. So let's get back into the code editor. So there are definitely a few different places where we could have where we could add in this logic. So up here, we're using the use reducer pattern for uh, for managing the tab state. And the reason for this is that um, it makes sure everything happens sequentially, whereas use state updates don't have that guaranteed uh, sequential, um, that, that's guaranteed sequence of operations. So um, this is important at the integration level. By doing it using use reducer, um, we can add the tabs based on when the integrate and when the page author um, adds them inside of the markup. And then we can always make sure they get added with this one first, this one second, etc. But like I was saying, there's multiple places where we could add in this keyboard functionality and this logic. We already have um, this set active tab, um, this remove tab, this add tab. So we could just have key bindings that query um, the tab list inside of the button itself. But this is really about setting um, sort of data information, setting what the active tab is. So I'm going to recommend that we add another um, resolver inside of our uh, reducer function. So uh, the reducer pattern was one that was made uh, common by Redux. And the reason it's called that is it runs through uh, an array reducer function. Um, the common pattern is that the first property is the state the second property is the action. Um, and then here we're using an object uh, to, to determine functions that will run and update the state when this gets called. So, um, so let's look at this and add a next. So resolve action type next. And I will be answering any questions um, that you would have in chat, um, especially around my weird coding preferences. Um, for instance, um, uh, I prefer this sort of like object syntax for dealing with reducer functions rather than switch statements. And part of that just comes down to um, switch statements not having that uh, sort of block scope for const and lets. All right, so let's see. Let's grab um, the active tab ID and the tab list from the state. Let's get the active tab index. All 
All right. Next tab will be, let's see, if the active tab index is um, greater than or equal to uh, tablist.length minus one, or actually, if the tab active tab index is just equal to the tablist.length minus one, we're going to return uh, tablist zero, the first one. Otherwise, tablist active tab index plus one. All right, and then we will use our nice little update state function here. Return update state active tab ID next tab dot ID. All right, so let's go back over here, refresh for good measure. All right, so let's tab through and then we get here. Of course we can't do anything yet. We haven't added in the key, the keyboard listener. So we will go back down here to the button and we need to create an event handler for handling the key up event. So we'll deconstruct the event object to just get the key and uh, resolve key, uh, resolve key, arrow right. And in this instance, we will want to run this tabs dispatch and choose to activate this event all right and then we will just check if the resolve key exists or if the um, if we have uh, a key binding um, for what gets hit and if we do we will run it as a function All right. and then we'll take this handle key up And looks like we created this props constant here. So we will go ahead and do an on key up, handle key up. So now, ideally, when I hit the arrow key, yes, we can hit the arrow key, and now it will loop through them.
So let's go back and quickly copy this. And then we will add another function doing something very similar. Tab, tab, tab. And then we can use our right arrow and it loops through. And we can use our left arrow and it loops through. And then if we tab, it goes into the content properly. Now, a keyboard user can, um, can navigate through these tabs as expected, and a screen reader can easily pick up the information because of the ARIA controls um, referencing the right ID. Now, the other issue that kind of gets brought up with React and we touched on um, is the issue with the page title. So right now in the app, we have kind of two screens that were being pulled in and we're just managing it with a basic use state. When I drill into each of these states um, or to each of these screens, um, we can have a, we have a property that will handle the updates and then we have a property um, for title that we're not currently using. So to be able to update the page title, and I also want to state flat out, um, there are there are NPM packages that are better uh, suited to manage this type of task, um, both from a actually navigating through pages. I definitely recommend React Router, but I felt it's important to understand that you can actually handle this particular um, issue within React by itself. We will just um, pass the title of the homepage being uh, welcome. And um, for the details page, see our components. <clears throat> and then let's open up this uh, this home page and we'll need to pull a couple hooks. Um, first, we will want to use use ref <clears throat> and then we will want to use um, use effect. So the reason that we want to use uh, use ref actually isn't related to the page title issue. But anytime you're using the single page application sort of architecture, you need to refocus the uh, the content whenever the page changes. So we're going to be using that um, here. So uh, const uh, uh, screen uh, elm equals use ref. And now by just adding this ref attribute here and referencing screen elm, we've kind of hooked into that and then we will want to use use effect. Use effect runs after the component gets mounted. And we will have document.title equals title. And uh, screen elm dot focus. And we need to go ahead and come in here and add a tab index of negative one. For those of you who aren't aware, adding a tab index of negative one allows you to programmatically focus onto an element, but doesn't allow the tab to naturally hit that item. <clears throat> All right, so let's go ahead and do that um, with the other page as well. Document.title equals title and screen Elm dot current dot focus. Did I do that on the last page? Oh, this is going to break because I need to use dot current. Okay. We can see here that the title is getting applied as welcome. And when we click view more, 
title is not defined. So obviously the first thing that we'll go and do is pick up on the title. And then when we refresh the page again, we can see welcome up here. And then when we click view more, uh, we can see CR components. I certainly did not hit every type of accessibility. The key takeaways that I'm hoping that you will have is that when you build your components, try to understand that the people that are consuming them uh, may have different contexts and needs than everything you can anticipate right now. So you're going to want to embrace sort of some smart defaults and the ability to be flexible. On the other hand, um, for complex components like tabs, you probably don't need as much from the integration side. I definitely appreciate um, you guys hanging in with us this far. Um, I know it's probably been a long virtual conference, um, so I guess I will answer any questions that are in chat. Otherwise, uh, thank you very much. Uh, once again, uh, my name is Russell Skaggs, and thank you for attending my presentation.